Anurag, welcome to Paisa Paisa. Thank you so much for doing this for our listeners. Thank you, Anupam. Happy to be here. I've listened to your podcast, especially a few which are focused on fintech. I heard the Jitain one. So, you know, pleasure to be here talking to you. Very kind of yours. Waiting for one card to be part of Paisa Paisa. I'm really thrilled. It's in fact one score and one card. I think from the time that I've been tracking. Let's start with one score actually, you know, because um, what was the opportunity and the use case out here? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, see, uh, the way we saw the opportunity, uh, you know, like if you just slice the entire population of India, we've got more than around 800 million adults. And we actually have more than 400 million of them holding a bureau score. And that makes us the largest credit score population in the world. We're bigger than US also. Uh, China doesn't have a credit bureau. So hence, uh, we happen to be the largest one. Now, uh, you know, and this has changed over last, I would say, around uh, around 2010, you know, 12 onwards in last 10 years, we have seen a massive growth all across categories, credit cards, personal loans, and all where personal credit has become much more widespread, broad based. And what other trend we saw, a lot of younger people accessing credit much earlier in their life. Uh, vis-a-vis the previous generation. So now we saw an opportunity that, you know, is there a way we can figure out, uh, you know, like a tool which we can give to customers so that they can understand and learn themselves. I'm like financial education uh, isn't a big subject in India uh, because, uh, you know, in India, we don't want to talk about money as much as we want to talk about other things. It's part of our culture. It's part of what it is. This is how we are wired. Uh, you know, uh, thankfully, uh, you know, what we notice that uh, we lo- Indians love numbers because we have been taught from very beginning in our career that, you know, 33 means pass, 60 means first class, 75 means dis- distinction. So we said, okay, if we can figure out a mathematical way to tell people and then rest comes from there. You know, the first idea is that, you know, uh, how, how do you uh, get to know about it? So I think uh, the way Credit One Score is built and what the problem it was solving is about let people be aware about their credit health and give them personalized nudges to educate them, um, builds lots of educational content about it, you know, so that people can refer to it and, you know, keep learning about this. It is still, as I said, it is, it's like a tool in your hand. We, it is not an overarching product, like a full-fledged education product. It is more about insights uh, and things like that. So does and, it work like yes. a regular credit score, like the higher the better and 795 up or 750, I don't know, 750, 800 upwards is good? Is that, is that, yeah. is that hard? So 750 and plus, uh, it's considered to be a good score. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the way, so the, the, the good thing is post-2008 crisis, uh, RBI, you know, actually gave licenses to credit bureaus. And, you know, we have one of the most advanced bureau market because all the global biggies operate in India. It's a regulated area. You know, every lender is supposed to submit data. And we decided on day zero to go with a positive bureau. The way two types of bureaus are defined, negative bureau means the banks only share the bad data. But in India, we opted for positive bureau. So this is a very rich data for banks and lenders to figure out, you know, who has uh, paid their loans in the past, which is a good indicator of future behavior, but also get to know about leverage. The way we are looking at the consumer side. So majority of the bureau was used by lenders to decide lending decisions. But our thesis is very simple and from that prevention is better than cure. You know, if you get to know about your score at the time of accessing, it's too late for you to fix it. You got to know in advance so that you can take action on, on top of it. And you know, like uh, the bureau score can be bad for various reasons. It could be your own behavior. It could be a misreporting. It could be, let's say, you believe that you're paid, but something is, did not happen in time. And all of this requires time for you to correct it. Uh, fortunately, I, I you know you caught up just last month. RBI has now brought even bureau reporting as part of ombudsman scheme. So the disputes between the borrowers and the bureau will also come under that, which will essentially allow customers to get their uh, bureau data fixed uh, much faster and much more, I would say, you know, comprehensively. So uh, the, the point we are trying to say is that uh, it's too late. If you've already got a problem, then you got time to fix it. And the way bureau score works, you, you can't delete old data. You can only improve upon by adding good data. Okay, so you need to give it time. So for you to understand, you have to start, first of all, understanding what are the factors which, you know, uh, you know, talk 
about score. Now, I'll tell you what, uh, if you look at the credit education about score, I'm like, of course, we have to commend people like Sybil, Experian, popularizing the in, even existence of score in customers' mind. Earlier, it was largely a bank product. But, uh, you know, and the first use case for Bureau Score came in about, can you leverage your score to get access to cheaper loans? A lot of apps and websites came about that and solved that problem. But again, as I say, we are solving slightly different problem. We, you know, we are not a loan app. We don't help people get access to credit on one score. It's a pure play credit education management product. So idea is that we are essentially catering to the population which is genuinely interested to know about the score and want to understand insights how to improve on better. Do you have uh, a tie with an existing bureau for the one? Yeah. Or is so, this... so we work with Sybil and Experian, the two largest bureau, where they are uh, partners. So all the data comes from the bureau, by the way. Mm. And uh, uh, the other thing we notice, you know, very interestingly, almost twenty-five to thirty percent of our customers are new to credit. Mm. Now, mind you, these guys have not accessed credit, but they're still intrigued about credit score, which is a very positive data for us to believe that. In general, younger generation is becoming more aware about credit than probably the previous one. And they're looking for these sources because, because there is no, nothing else we offer in our app. So they come about because they want to understand about credit. Uh, of course, we have a planner product there where we guide them in case you have a credit card, how should you go about using it so that your score will look like that. And if you want to actually take a credit card, you take a credit card right there so that your credit history journey starts there. Yeah. So, on one score, Anurag, what are your future plans? Uh, you just so, how the journey has been, you know, with twenty five thirty percent. Yeah. So, uh, to be, to be, uh, you know, Frank, uh, we got surprised by the growth. We've been almost now, you know, two and a half year old in that product. We have more than twenty million downloads there, and uh, as I said, so far we have been just offering, uh, you know, credit score as a service to our customers. Now our customers are asking us, what next can you do? Um, uh, so one, uh, we are planning to launch a personal loan product there in partnership with banks, uh, wherein uh, you know we will essentially you know pre-qualify customers based on you know criteria, and we might offer them loans. Uh, at the same time, the other way look at it, a lot of customers are telling us that you're looking at our credit data. And then guiding us, why can't you take more data from us, like banks are data, and give us even more comprehensive view? Now, that's something we are evaluating, given that account aggregators are coming in. This will allow us to essentially access the data, like bureau data, on the flyover APIs. And then we can present a comprehensive view to the customers. You know, a few things which uh, stood us apart is that, you know, uh, we are extremely privacy conscious app. We never took access to your email or SMS. So it is actually offering the services what it has been designed for. Uh, these subtle things, people really appreciate that. Uh, you know, that you know, this app is uh, quite, you know, they, they think that this is actually solving their side of the problem rather than pushing something uh, on top of it. So we will always remain true to this, uh, you, know, you know, thesis and whatever our product we offer. So on the data side, we have big plans given the account director coming in. But on the selling more product side, whatever we decide, we will be heavily curated by us. So that, uh, because there are other platforms available who offer you aggregation services where you can choose your loans and credit cards and mutual funds and all that. We don't intend to be in that, uh, you know, in, in that business. Yeah. So let's shift focus for the main, you know, to the other product that you've got, which is the one card. Very interesting. So Anurag, let's talk about cards. Popular and yet not easily available. The data that I have, I think we've got about 700 million uh, credit cards or 70, I don't know what the number is. 78 million to be precise, yeah. 78 million credit cards and the user base actually is what, less than 40 million? But look, we're yeah. basically saying and almost two credit cards per person kind of <laughs> a thing. Eight crore people and, you know, eight crore cards and four crore people who are handling it. Where did you see the problems and what were you trying to address, you know, when you woke up one Friday and said, I want to launch one? <laughs> yeah. So uh, to understand this, probably we'll have to understand a little context. I'm going to take you back uh, in the history, uh, given that I happen to be part of banks when the credit card revolution started. So if you look at the credit card industry in India, we are in the third stage of evolution. The first stage was 90s to 2000, which was largely run by foreign banks. 
you know, Indian banks didn't offer. Then came 2000 uh, plus onwards where Indian banks came in, ICICI, HDFC, Axis, and they, they grew the business. And then 2008 crisis happened. While it affected lots of businesses, it affected this business, you know, very large because it was an uh, unsecured one. For the first time, this industry was seeing such a big crisis. Uh, so actually the base degrew from 22 million cards in 2008, we went down to actually 18 million cards in 2010. And 2012 onwards only when we saw this is a growth happening. And over the last 10 years, we've seen almost 25% CAGR, which is one of the most stable growth, uh, you know, in financial services, retail financial service category. Now, what is driving this? So, you know, if you look at, you know, before that, credit card used to be an elite product. Even in cities like Mumbai, Delhi, you will see pockets where you will get cards and you can use the card. Okay. What has happened in the last four or five years, this is becoming a more like a utility product. And I would like to give more credits to merchants because they actually, you know, popularize the usage of the, uh, you know, card and started from demand and GST and then massively accelerated during COVID times. So all the categories where you usually make payments, you know, like... Uh, uh, cards became ubiquitous. The second big push came from UPI itself. Uh, UPI is like infrastructure layer, you know, like you know, all of us use UPI. So traditional banking evolution used to be bank accounts to ATMs to debit, eventually get to credit and net banking. UPI is actually making people comfortable using mobile, you know, money on digital means. This is extremely important, uh, you know, for categories like this. Now the third point is that uh, you know. Credit card has always, this is one of the most concentrated product category in the country. I'm like four banks control almost 70% market share in this business. And the reason is it's a fairly technical business, uh, a lot of technology oriented business, um, you know, unsecured risk. Also the payouts are delayed. I'm like, you issue the card and then you got to do lots of other marketing to make sure that the portfolio stays with you. The good news is the relationship with the customer is usually quite long. You know, on an average, customer stays with the bank card for almost eight to nine years. So, you you know, as long as you are able to crack the relationship, it's a quite a remunerative product for the banks. But the it's a cold start problem. You've got to start lots of upfront investment. So uh, I think what we are seeing that as the demands, so it is, traditionally it has been a push product. Mm. You know, cards used to get sold. Somebody will catch hold of you and push a product. And the, <laughs> there is also a nuance there is, Unlike most of the other banking products, it's not a time-sensitive need-based product. What do I mean by that? You don't get up in the morning and say, I want to apply for a credit card. Mm -hmm. We should do it for most of the other banking products. It, the contra is also true, by the way, anybody can be sold a credit card. Mm -hmm. And that's why it is like a, what we call is an FMCG product of banking. Uh, and it was pushed. What we have seen that push has become pull thanks to this utility-based orientation. It, 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 today, credit cards are not flash value product. This is largely utility-based product. And all across, you can use it. Uh, and which is what we see that, uh, in, especially in the last, uh, you know, like you talk about 80 million cards, it was just 40 million just four years back. So this is doubled in last four to five years. Okay. The other thing to note about is that India is becoming super young. And, you know, when, you know, like younger population, having massive aspiration yeah. and they don't want to wait for things to happen also the a lot of consumer behavior have shift from asset creation to consumption and these are trends which are we're just riding on that so all of this is adding you know like the demand generation for this now i'll give you a small anecdote uh, we have you know if you look at the rbi data in june the banks issued two million cards on an average you've got around 30 to 40 percent approval rate in a product like this that means five to six million people actually applied for this product in a month you analyzed it annualized it you're basically getting almost 50 to 60 million people who would apply for this product in a year wow. and that's a very large number because we estimate out of 400 million people in the bureau the customer base who can be issued or are targeted from a risk point of view for a credit card would be close to 120 to 130 million because you know naturally a lot of borrowing is in, you know, cards are mostly still focused on top 100 cities, locations, uh, you know, can, you know, like uh, comfortableness with the, you know, digital medium to use credit and things like that. But it's rapidly growing. So I, I think what we are seeing is very tip of the iceberg. I'm like, we predict a even bigger growth in, in times to come. Yeah. I don't know, two years 
seven lakh users. Hey, what you're already one percent of the entire issued base, right? <laughs> How has the journey been so far? And more, more importantly, any insights, any learnings, any behavioral trends that you can see from your user base in these last two years? So I think, uh, uh, as I said, we are riding the wave the way industry is watching. Uh, industry is growing, and we are also growing with that. And the demand has become secular. It's very, very strong. So you know, like the uh, people are looking for experience-oriented product because it's a very high-touch product, even post-sale. You know, unlike any other loan product where you usually you don't call, nobody calls you unless you default. But this is not a product like that. You have lots of things, rewards, EMI. So hence, uh, one of the reasons why people have opted for product like this is uh, essentially you know look for good experience. And we work with bank partners in the back, so it, you get actually best of both worlds. You get a, you know, like a, a solidness and robustness of a bank partner and a customer experience built by a tech company. So it's a good mixture of both. Now, uh, the way one of the few things we saw that, okay, people are over indexing on customer experience, especially because during COVID times, the physical touch became like absolutely absent, um, you know, and we have seen even the banks, by the way, adopting to video KYC and all that. So naturally tech companies are able to design experience even better. So that is one which is a very, very important thing. Second thing is, um, you know, I, I'm going to make two contra points here. Uh, the second point is that uh, we have seen digi digital spends, you know, proportion growing big time in overall card base. So before COVID, almost 60 to 70% of the transactions were physical, 30, 35% were digital. Now this ratio is almost reverse. But the important point to notice, during peak of the lockdown, this was almost 80, 90%. But actually, 40% physical spends have come back. So people actually have started going out and using it. We expect this number to somewhere settle at around 60, 40. Uh, you know, as the economy is opening up more, because people are moving out. Uh, so I think this is a very distinct change, uh, what we have seen. Uh, the third thing is also, uh, we have seen that, uh, you know, like uh, EMIs are becoming really mainstream. Uh, you know, like, and I think all of us uh, now the new names called BNPL, but otherwise, uh, us what was called EMI, EMIs, uh, and both brands and retailers are participating in these programs in a big way because you know EMIs are coming an extremely important tool to drive affordability for Indian consumers. And one of the reason people use credit is credit card is primarily to access credit, mm. and uh, while of course it's also used as a payment instrument. So EMI programs are making even more, I mean, we have seen category, earlier it was largely restricted to categories like big ticket electronics. We are seeing proliferation of EMIs across categories. So fashion, healthcare, uh, lots of other categories. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, these are few things, uh, you know, I would like to talk about it. And sure. last but not the least, uh, thanks to uh, credit score awareness, people are generally more aware about uh, you know, credit health, uh, because, you know, earlier credit card was more of a, what we call is a, uh, you know, a discretionary usage product. You know, you will use it for things which are more discretionary in nature. What we are seeing that credit cards are being used more mainstream, and this is becoming more, you know, regular use, uh, you know, for you. And that's why your attachment to the product is very, very different. Uh, and this is extremely important because when the it's a cyclical product linked to the way consumer life you know consumer economy operates, as long as you are in the you know like top of the mind recall, this reflects into the usage, the defaults, all of this gets driven from there. So this is an extremely important behavior which will uh, you know be helpful for building this long term industry here. Very interesting. So folks, we're going to take a small break here and we're going to get into the actual products on the other side of the break. That's one score and one card. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Hello, hello, hello. It's been another great week on the IBM Podcast Network. On the 100th episode of Marathi Kirtkitun, the Deshmukhs talk about their podcasting journey and how the podcast came into their life. They are joined by their son, the traveling professor, Smarter with Sid host, Siddharth Deshmukh, and IBM co-founder, Kavita Rajwade. On Simplified, Chuck, Shriket, and Narin discuss the fascinating topic of cryptocurrency and blockchain with guest Siddharth Rao. On Nankari, Archit speaks to writer Samanth Subramanian about how he writes about India's diverse food habits and the two geek out over their favorite coastal cuisines. 
on Credit Smart with Sybil Anupam Gupta, host of the Pesa Vesa podcast, and Sujata Ahlawat, Senior Vice President, TransUnion Sybil, shares the steps to begin a credit journey and also tell you how to maintain a healthy credit score. On Postcards from Nowhere, in episode 10 of a series, Ireland Unraveled, Utsav uncovers the story of Magdalene Laundries and how it relates to an alternative rock band and a boy's search for his mother. Once again, I'd like to remind you all about our merch store. Go check it out on the website, ibmpodcast.com. There's a tab for a shop. Click that and it'll take you to our store. Also, do follow us on social media. We're IBM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Please do spread the word about the show. That really, really does help us. And finally, do remember, rate us or review us wherever you are listening. And that could also be YouTube. We have a number of channels on YouTube where you can go and check out our shows. You can go and find those channels on ivmpodcast.com slash YouTube. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors this week, HDFC Mutual Fund, TransUnion Sybil, SBI Life Insurance, Checkpoint Software, and Small Case. Thank you so much for making this possible. And welcome back. Anurag, let's get into the product uh, one score. You know, I want to understand how one score actually helps me to improve my credit habit. I the last before we went into the break, you spoke about how EMIs are becoming popular. I you know for old timer like me, when you say EMI on credit card, there's always that danger. And you spoke about it also. You spoke about how. There's always a danger of overspending and then not being able to manage and then credit card interest rates are crazy. How does one score work out it? Does it help me or, you know, is there any inbuilt way for you to improve credit habits? Awesome. Uh, no, very nice question. Very relevant one, Anupam. Very close to my heart as well. So before we look at, take the product level question, we have to first understand that how can you even be aware about where you stand on your credit health? And, you know, that's where what we are seeing is, especially what happened, uh, you know, like if you look at 10 years back, people will typically take loans quite late in their life. Like they've saved money for like 10, 15 years and they look for home loans. Uh, people like me, when I was young, I'm 45 now, by the way. So like 15 years back, when we were like three, four years in the job, it was a kick for us to take a house loan and buy a house, <laughs> which was very different. But the current generation is accessing credit much earlier and much more consumption oriented and they're doing it more frequently. So uh, like I, if, even if you take my score, you will probably take three, four cards and probably two, three loans. But many a time when I meet young customers of ours in one score, they've accessed actually more than six loans in two years itself or like in a year itself. But the first stop is that and the reason is because you know, the consumption is driving and consumption credit is much easily available at the point of consumption. Thanks to a lot of good work done by both banks as well as tech companies in that area. Mm. The point is that it creates a problem that how do you track all of these loans? <laughs> you know, like whether this has been adequately reported, when, whether your repayments have happened on time or not. So, you know, there is a first need itself is to get a, access to you know, like a single statement and, you know, see, okay, how am I doing on my loans? How many loans have been actually opened in my names and all that? So, so that's the first step. The second step is, you know, there could also be a miss, uh, you know, reporting uh, of the data. Your PAN number might have been used by someone else, either genuinely or it's just an error. And suddenly a loan get attached to you, which you actually never took it. Or you believe that you have repaid the loan, but there was some fee there which did not get processed and uh, things like that. That could be the second thing. And third could be, uh, there could be a genuine error by a lender where some payment did not happen on time and things like that. And, or probably you missed the payments. So what I'm trying to say that if you look at this, the first two stages are pure matching. It's almost 30 to 40% is this. As long as you can solve this itself is a big task. And then of course, is the second part, which is how do you help people, you know, like make sure that, uh, you know, you're on uh, your, your payments on time. Now, the, the first step is, Okay, you took a loan, probably more than what you can pay. That's one problem to solve. But because we're talking about lots of small loans, there is a very high chance that you just miss because you just did not pay attention to it. Um, and many times the loans are being taken at merchant place. You don't even know the lenders behind. Of course, RBI is trying to solve all of that, you know, so that you are more aware. Of. But if you are able to track your credit health, then at least there is a uh, you know, like promptness in the customer to make sure that they are able to repay on time. Uh, the second thing is, uh, this is what I call is the, you know, the carrot approach, but the, also is the stick is like, 
if you miss a payment, let's say somebody's taking a loan of let's say 10,000 and his EMI is hardly 1,000 bucks. And they say, fine, even if I miss by like five days, how does it matter? They don't know that this will affect the, uh, probably a <laughs> you know, 50 lakh rupee home loan which they will take after three years. So, you know, when you're able to understand the impact of your action, you know, the way, uh, you know, the credit scoring is done, uh, then your attention towards this is, uh, you know, much more, uh, much more serious. And you also have to remember the context of uh, financial education we spoke about earlier. Mm. In general, we don't like to talk about money. Uh, we don't want to talk about money with our parents, with our colleagues. We have seen this change in the investment side. A lot of people, you know, like invest the way their friends invest or they talk to their colleagues, but credit is still much more personalized uh, because uh, my expect, my, you know, the way I look at credit, the way I want to, I'm like for somebody, you know, if he's making, uh, uh, you know, like 10,000 rupees and spending 12,000 rupees for a phone is okay. At the same time, somebody who's making 50,000 rupee for them, they don't want to spend even 30,000 on the phone because their approach towards credit is different. It's very personalized. Yeah. Uh, it is not uh, like, for example, when you put out a news that, okay, this fund has grown by 10%, everybody wants to invest in that mutual fund. That doesn't work like that in credit. Uh, it is much more personalized. So hence, you know, like for, before you fix the credit, you have to first understand the credit. And as I said before, it is more preventive. You got to know before so that you can give yourself time. Uh, I get to meet a lot of customers and say, okay, we want to now we get declined for a loan and I want to take a loan. How can I fix my score? And there's nothing can fix in the next, in, in, in next 10 days. Minimum it requires three months. The way we advise almost six months, because as I said, the way bureau scoring works, they take all the data, past data and make a model around it based on your past behavior, we're predicting the future behavior. Now one can argue that, yeah, I did my mistakes in the past. How are you saying that I won't make? But unfortunately, fortunately, the data has to speak for itself. This is how the credit scoring works. So you need to give yourself time to prove yourself that, okay, now you have changed, your income style has changed, you become more, uh, you know, I would say serious about these things. So I think the first objective is to just make people aware. Now, we are also living in an era where time is less for everyone. We don't want to spend time on a subject. So we, and that's why we call ourselves a tool that you give it to yourself, Check it. I, I'll tell you, we started with as basic as that a lot of people didn't know that this is a monthly score. It gets updated. So, you know, we build a small things that, okay, the next score is due after 28 days. Oh, mm. that gives a habit for you to come and try it out. The good thing is, I think everybody, a lot of people know about this, something called score exist. I think this is done not by us. Uh, this is done by media. And I would say, they, the good work done by civil experience they've been able to there is something called credit score which exists yeah, yeah. we we are taking the next step now we are stopping there we are not helping uh, so there are also lots of products which are also help you let's say get access to cheaper loans and all that these are secondary objectives or let's say uh, you know uh, you actually have errors in your reports like you know something not so that can only be corrected by the originator which is the lender in this case so, you know, like, uh, uh, but good thing is that since a lot of people are aware about it, they're more conscious about it. They have time to go get, get, get it fixed and all that. So this is how we are weaving the, now uh, we of course spoke about, a lot of people talk about, should this be told in the school and, and things like that. These are even larger objectives as a product company. We are playing our part in that because, you know, like we just thought a mathematical way to explain people is a much easier way to catch attention and then give them personalized nudges. Uh, in fact, one of the feature we have in our app is called Planner, which is about if your score is bad, plan. So give us a time and then the, the algorithm will guide you what all action can you take to improve score. Uh, we, as, we also get people who say, fine, how can I improve score? Now you can repay your old loans or you can get access to fresh credit. And that's where we stuck into the chicken and egg story that, you know, if you don't have a good score, you can't get access to credit and, if, and vice versa. So one of the products which has worked really well and we highly recommend people is that take a secured card. You know, like you put money in deposits, take a card against that, start using it. It will start improving your score because it's a credit uh, a product. And the approval rates are almost 100% because you're putting your money on the block. Now, um, we got so many requests on that, we actually ended up launching that feature on our product. So if your score is bad, you can actually take a secure card uh, on our platform where you could put and you know we could marry the two insights very well 
all of us indians whenever we have some extra cash we end up putting in deposits mm-hmm. so it's yeah. a very organic behavior for indians it's not a new behavior uh, so all of us have fixed deposits <laughs> that that's like we are told by our parents whenever you have excess cash just put money in deposits so we say fine it's a very organic behavior for you just take a card against it start building history eventually it will your score will improve and then you know you can get access to serious credit later on yeah so building on that question the same thing uh, i mean you're building on your answer sorry not not the question but what's your suggestion or your advice to new to credit or you know actually let's talk about people with with low credit score no credit history what what what's your message to them either to start okay people who don't have a credit score what would you tell them and two for people who have a low credit score how should they improve it yeah quick uh, absolutely so i think you know like majority of the banks are, are focused towards giving credit to salaried uh, people so one most of the people start their credit history when they are working for a you know established corporate uh, you know employee but as we saw the job market is changing a lot in the early stage a lot of people are you know freelancing or working for startups which are not well established corporates so they don't fit into those criteria which most of the large banks have it so you know i think what we have seen that you know earlier two wheeler loan used to be the first product for most of the life uh, because an education loan which is traditionally the first product for most of the country is, is not there for india because all the parents save money for the kids uh, it is one of their uh, uh, biggest saving goal uh, we have seen that that being replaced by emis a lot of people are taking emis on that so that could be one product uh the second product which as i just said uh, you we we tell people that why don't you put a small deposits because then it also starts adding to your overall financial uh, you know benefits second thing is start tracking your score and more importantly i think you touched upon in a previous question <coughs> also having a very strong uh, you know like uh, control over your core credit product itself so don't take a loan which you can't repay uh you know the uh, a good thumb rule of course the thumb rule can vary for different people but you know typically your emis you know should not be more than 40 to 50% of your monthly disposable income okay naturally as the income goes up this number can go up to 60 70 because your rest of the expenses which is your running expenses will not grow at the same pace like your rentals and your other household expenses that is one way to look at is the second way to look at is with the you know like uh, especially if you're looking products like which are more transactional credit in nature because you know you don't look at the credit you look at the end product for example we're looking for a bigger phone or let's say looking for a even longer foreign holiday or whatever could be this just make sure that you know like uh, the credit element of that is also thought about it uh especially for using so i i think most of the banks have now started giving digital experience for tracking your spends and all that i would highly encourage apart from tracking your credit score you should also track your you know spendings like this in fact that is one of the big use case for our product in in one card as you rightly said from most of the people believe that if they use credit card they will end up overspending what we have seen is a contra behavior in a product like ours because the you are getting better visibility of your spends then people start consolidating the spends here because this gives them a you know a feeling of control they can track categories and all that uh, so uh, you know at, at the same time we shouldn't create huge plans because then we are not able to honor it you know because you know like good old days people used to write diaries Uh, i don't think that's possible uh, right now uh, given that our spends are happening at call across so i would also <laughs> advise people to keep simple goals so that they can monitor it i think uh, consistency and discipline is more important than the innovation of the ideas in in my opinion here nice consistency and discipline folks nothing like that they are really really important okay i'm not just winding up the episode now last couple of questions uh, on one card right um you've already got a pretty large large base of users what is your positioning in the sense that how are you different from other cards features reward points what do you offer differently to your target audience i'm just asking the people probably listeners who've not heard of your card or who've thought of applying for one what can they expect yeah so uh, first thing we are a bank led product 
so we are uh, a credit card, uh, like co-brand credit card with the bank partner. And hence, first of all, uh, the way uh, the card is positioned, uh, the way you know underwriting and the risk segmentation happens is very much like a bank operates on. Because and you're making this point, folks, just so that you differentiate from other products in the digital products in the market which i think typically are prepaid instruments or you know yeah. credit, so, credit so and instruments whereas absolutely so we, a credit card absolutely uh, in fact for you know sometimes we get asked this question and from that are you only catering to elite segment who are already well risk uh, you know like they have served a good history so for new to credit and people who did not does not bad credit we actually launched a secured card which i tell you and i highly encourage we've already you know like seen good traction of that product as well because you know the moment you're able to build history you're able to get access to you know like completely unsecured product so that's how we have solved that of course there are some of my uh, fintech friends have solved for that uh, uh, for that segment uh, differently, but we are a credit card. All our products are credit card, which are done in partnership with banks. Um, you know, and since you know it's a bank-led product, the risk segmentation, risk approval is very much similar to the bank. Uh, while we, of course, offer lots of you know like offers, EMIs, and everything, what has differentiated us two things. One, uh, one is that we are focused on improving customer experience uh, from grounds up, and the reason is possible because we build completely in-house tech. And credit card tech stack is complex one because you have to get it certification from uh, you know networks and all that. Uh, so what our belief is that you know like features matter, but actually the core experience because it's a very high touch product, right? From getting access to the product and making sure that you know like your reward. I'm like I'll give you an insight. And most of the customers don't see rewards like benefits. They see rewards as their rights. Hmm. They believe that I'm going to use my transaction from cash to card. So you know. Don't make any condition there. Make it simple for me to access it and all that. So we do a lot of work there. We do a lot of good work with our merchant partners to co-create experiences. Being a tech company, it is in our DNA to, let's say, integrate faster and better uh, with our partners. So so that is the uh, you know second bit of it. So you know what I would say the customer experience that is something which outshines us. Like second thing is we are known for metal card. <laughs> you oh, know, yeah. like uh, everybody speaks that that's become like we started actually in our wait list. Initially, we thought we will issue metal card to only our first 10,000 customers. Hmm. But people just loved it so much that it is stuck to our brand. So right, right now, all of our customers get metal card. Nice. And, uh, you know, that's a very good pull, uh, you know, factor right now for the customers. Uh, so that's another thing people, you know, uh, like us about. The third thing is, you know, credit card is a very uh, service oriented product, you know, like because you have disputes, you have, you know, like many other things, rewards, EMI. And I think calling a call center is a good thing, but uh, a lot of people don't want to do that. So that's where our app experience helps us, you know, like almost 70 to 80 percent of the customer servicing happens in the app itself. Uh, and whatever you call a uh, call center for, everything has been built. And it's a journey. I'm not saying that everything is sure, sure. already built. We keep building as we you know, grow. So that's other thing people love about uh, us, uh, that apart from using the card, they, they love the app experience uh, you know, more. Let's talk about the MITC, most important terms and conditions. A, the costs. Do you have any costs out there or is it a lifetime free, uh, it's a free life, card? It's, or it's a lifetime free card. Okay, there are no, no, no hidden costs, no hidden charges, sign up, nothing. No, nothing. We just, uh, so there is no lifetime, uh, sorry, there's no joining fee, there's no annual fee on our product. I think the fees as such, overall card market, as you know, is going away. Most of the banks offer you free card or otherwise they put a condition to it that if you spend this much. So a lot of, for us, it's no joining fee, no annual fee. Yeah. And of course, the interest rate. I, I believe it's called APR now. I don't even. What does the APR stand for? It's annualized, annualized percentage rate. Uh, annualized percentage rate. But hit me with that number. <laughs> so the way. So usme kya hota hai? Why it is called an APR different than interest rate? Because what happens is that, unlike any other loan product, most of the credit card revolve revolving is for shorter tenures, like two months or three months and four months. And hence, banks have been traditionally giving you monthly interest rates because you are revolving only for couple of months uh, i'm like if you want to revolve for long you would rather take an emi why would you revolve on the card because it's high cost uh, revolve and but rbi said you should put out apr so that you know customer is aware about it our aprs are lower than the market it, it you know our bank partners typically decide between uh, you know 30 to 36% it you know it varies segment to segment 
but relatively lower than the rest of the market. Yeah, folks, remember that that's almost three percent a month, which is pretty expensive. Be disciplined about your credit <laughs> yeah. habits. Always important. I know. Talking of which, how does the EMI work? Would that would also have an interest rate? Right? I mean, your yes. Let's so say there are I, two. Let yeah. Let's just say that, that I buy an iPhone of I don't know fifty thousand bucks and I stagger it at ten thousand per month for five months. How will that work for me? So typically, EMI uh, interest rates are lower. They are in the range of around sixteen to seventeen percent. So through your program, I would highly recommend people to, if they if they want to actually want to have a flexibility of repayment, they should offer EMI rather than Revolve. I agree with that. Uh, having said that, EMI, there are two methods for EMI conversion. Uh, a lot of customers opt for EMI at the point of transaction itself. Uh, that is called no-cost EMI or rather zero-cost EMI as it's called. In this, what happens is that interest is charged to the customer, but it is paid by the brand or by the merchants. And we have players like Fine Labs, Razorpay, enabling that a lot. So we are, of course, partners to them. So that is one way to look at it. In this case, like example, you said, you will not pay the interest. Rather, it will get charged, but upfront discount will be paid by the brand to the, to the transaction itself. That's one way to look at it. And it is disclosed to the customer as part of the upfront transaction itself. The second way to do it, when customers decides to convert EMI after the transaction, and we allow that in our app itself, uh, you know, and there, of course, the interest will be charged to you, but, and it will be paid by the customer. So we have interest paid by the merchant stroke brand upfront or interest paid by this. So EMI is a very good way to bring flexibility in managing payments on credit cards. I would highly encourage, you know, all your customers to not only on us, but even any, any other credit card they're using, please use it more effectively. Yeah, listeners, Anurag, I wish that we <laughs> podcast doesn't have customers as yet. We don't charge for it. But folks, just a small note out there when you're doing any of these EMIs or BNPLs, please, yeah, please just look at the terms and conditions. I think, Anurag, you have to, all providers now have to give a detailed chart or a table explaining the monthly outgo interest rate. It's pretty much upfront and transparent now. There's no way that you can sneak in something out there, right? Yeah, absolutely. The RBI, especially the last guideline made it even clear, but just want to clarify, since we are always been bank led. So, you know, like all the MITCs are built by the bank partners itself. So we are displaying in our app uh, from day one and uh, the bureau reporting the statements. So we operate like a traditional card as far as those parts are concerned. Uh, but you're right now, even more disclosure, there are RBIs put out guidelines, like if the card is not being used for in, it's been inactive, it has to be canceled yeah. and things like that. So again, uh, a lot of customer protection measures have been announced and you know, like where tokenization is happening, this will allow people to safeguard their cards, which are stored at the merchant base. So a huge focus, because what happens is that as the proliferation of these products are increasing, this is becoming more broad-based. So it's mm -hmm. no more restricted to, let's say, a one set, set of customers. This is all across, you know, like across 100 cities. So definitely, uh, I'm like, we have to inbuild these mechanism, the product itself, so that we don't, we avoid any adverse impact of digitization. Yeah, folks, that's why it's called MITC, most important terms and conditions. Okay, I'm not, last question before we wrap up you've got a very interesting positioning, right? You've got a metal card for digital savvy customers. So it sounds, sounds quite interesting. <laughs> what are your future plans? So I think, uh, you know, like uh, uh, metal will continue with us because it is kind of, it's like a brand people associate ourselves with. Now, I think the question you are trying to ask me is that, uh, you know, will plastics die in future at some point in time or something <laughs> like that? So I think very relevant question. I get this, I ask this question a lot in a lot of my interaction with uh, especially the, you know, young uh, customers or engineering communities and all that. So very valid question. Uh, and because we have seen, look at UPI, it is a completely homegrown solution and it kind of leapfrog. It's the largest interbank interoperable system in the world right now. So as a tech company, we will be extremely flexible in building products as, you know, come in the future. We're very excited about, you know, RBI just announced to do a credit card to be used on UPI or something else might come up in future. As a tech company, we will be happy to innovate around that because, you know, like uh, the reason why, you know, uh, 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 my belief is that uh, the credit card systems are proliferating is because it's a very good mix of merchants and banks working together. Because credit card is an intermediate product. 
Like, let's say take, you take a personal loan, you take a home loan, you take a savings account. It is between you and the bank. Credit card is all about merchants. You take it for something to use it for. And I think that any new product which is trying to solve for transaction credit has to serve this uh, purpose. So we are happy to innovate around that. We are a tech company, so our ability to build will be even better. So UPI credit or let's say touch credit or, you know, or I don't know what other forms of credit will appear in India. Given the size of the opportunity, we would be one of the first one to take advantage of that. Fantastic. And on that positive and exciting note, that is a wrap on this episode of Pesa Pesa. My guest, Anurag Sena, co-founder and CEO of FPL Technologies, the good folks behind One Score and One Card. Anurag, thank you so much for listening to our listeners. Thank you, Anpam. Happy to be here. No material on the show should be considered as financial advice. The material on the show is for informational purposes only. Please consult a financial advisor before taking any investment decision.